All right, thanks folks. Uh, I'm challenged with talking with all of you after you've eaten lunch and your eyes are a little heavy. So we're gonna try to keep you awake. But first I got a question for everybody is, most of you from Florida? Grew up in Florida. What part of Florida? Uh, about an hour away, Wildwood. Wildwood, nice. Tell me something unique about where you grew up. Um, there's like a lot of trains. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. I saw some other hands. Now you're probably not going to lift your hands. You're like, hey, man, I'm not even going to say that. How about you, man? Land of Lakes. Tell me something unique about Land of Lakes. This ought to be a layup for you. Lots of lakes. Lots of lakes. How about that, trash? <laughs> Did I see your hand up? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, you volunteered. Um, Orlando. Orlando. And we could go on and on and on about Orlando. Tell me something unique that everybody else doesn't know about. I got yeah, one. What? Traffic. <laughs> Traffic is interesting. So we're going to talk a lot about the show and what we do. And I also wanted to ask you one other question. When you think of a fishing show, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And I'm going to start right here. She's like, you ain't talking to me, are you? Yes. You. Yes. Okay. She's like, you know I'm asleep. OK. <laughs> what do you think of a fishing show? Right? Like that. That's good. Great. Great answer. <laughs> Any others? How about you, sir? Uh, oh, I've only been fishing once, but yeah, basically just like... Exactly. Fishing. Okay. <laughs> well, here's what we've done. We have taken a fishing show and brought in a whole new concept. So take a look at the sizzle reel, and it'll kind of give you a heads up of what you can expect in our presentation today. Ronnie, what's a sizzle reel? The sizzle reel. Great question. John, a sizzle reel is more, nothing more than a promo reel. What it is is this is what my sponsors get, and you want to give them a snapshot of your entire season or your entire show, at least the way you present it, in a matter of about two and a half minutes. So they call it a sizzle reel because it's got so much sizzle bang and pop and all sorts of bells and whistles to keep you focused on what's going on with the entire season. So it gives you kind of a snapshot. That's basically what it is. Remember that term, you might see it on an exam. We've all heard the stories. I once caught a fish this big. Bam! Yeah! <laughs> but what's the story behind all of those tales? What drives people to our oceans, lakes, and streams? Oh. Is it to connect with nature? Is it to live out one of man's oldest occupations? Oh, right. Got it. Wow. There you go. That's Florida. <laughs> or is it a chance to heal the soul with a time-honored family tradition? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Florida, baby. Fall, oh, come and get you some. Yes. Yeah. In fishing, there's the hunt. Yeah. Pam, pam, pam. There's the challenge every time you hit the water. Got it, folks. There's the camaraderie. You want to put like a 10 push up wager? Yeah, let's do that. And then there's the stories. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Only in Tampa Bay, baby. Meet Ronnie Gray, a former All American athlete an officer in the United States Marine Corps, and a corporate executive in the medical device industry. Man, you can't beat it when you work this hard and you get to a nice fish. His passion is fishing with friends. Oh, <laughs> look at that, man. Smile, brother. And learning stories about their life's experiences. I was uh, diagnosed with stage four uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. I wouldn't change having cancer. I think it has made me a better and stronger person. I think it'll just continue to benefit me later in life. But when you get down to it, we're all just trying to find our way. I call it burning the day down, maximizing the day, since you never know when your number's gonna be called. Sometimes it's an upstream struggle. My biological mom was murdered by my father, mm. whom I was named after. Because when you get down to it, we're all just trying to find our way. We fish to get our minds off things and to focus on something else and 
and that's okay. Sometimes it's an upstream struggle. I grew up poor. When you don't have anything, you feel like you always got to hustle. And I feel that to this very day. If, if you're not doing it, you know what, that guy over there, he's hustling. But there are always new horizons. I didn't realize the impact that I had on their life, you know. It, it means a lot to me. That's really what it's about. It really makes a difference. Yeah. You have to be willing to get your clothes wet. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and your hands dirty. I mean, just perfect specimen. Your failures will teach you as much as your successes. We hold the children. That's right. The children are the future. You're going to have a seriously lost generation, as you're starting to see now. Mentoring programs are great, but father is what's up. No two expeditions are the same. Hey, Mark, you know uh, my cat's been asking about it. She's like, laugh! Laugh! And the beauty of it all you gotta love it. is in the journey. What would you want people to say about Don Eddy? Good person, dependable, loyal, believes in God, good husband, a good father. At the end of the day, those are things that are important to me. It wouldn't get no better than that. It's not just fishing. Heard it here. It's a fishing story. That's the essence of what fishing means to me. Now, I'd like to walk you through how I came to this place. Whenever you meet someone and, and you see some successes about their life, nine times out of ten, I've done it before, so don't be afraid to admit to it. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. You say, man, I wish I had that. I wish I was able to do this. I wish I was able to do that. But when you get to know a person and you find out all their life's experiences, you realize, mm, not sure I want that because of what it took to get to this place. That's what I'm gonna talk to you about today. The fishing story and where it came from and how we develop our story. Obviously, we're tied into Pasco County, and I think that's important for you folks that are studying in tourism um, and how that works. We're gonna get into that in a little bit more detail and how they're tied in to what we're doing to help them as well. There's a mutually beneficial uh, 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 event right here, and I think it, it'll be very informative for you. So, I want you to remember this throughout the entire presentation. Your output today is the accumulation of all your life's experiences. Good, bad, <coughs> ugly, emotional, painful. Well, Ronnie, I grew up without my mother. I grew up without my father. Well, Ronnie, we were poor. Well, Ronnie, uh, I didn't have running water where I grew up. Think about all those things because they make you who you are. And you gotta be able to appreciate them because at the end of the day, that accumulation creates the output. And you'd be surprised, some of the most successful people in the world come from a very dark place as we would see it. But they knew how to turn it around. So, uh, I grew up in San Antonio, and please, no, this is not a picture of good times, and that's not JJ up there, that's actually me and my brothers, my mom and dad, and my sisters. Uh, this is probably a little bit too old for some of you guys. Uh, good times was back in the day, we used to watch good times, and they had afros big enough to where you couldn't even walk inside a door. Now, the reason why my afro was so much bigger is because it was really by default. Uh, how many of y'all remember the curls back in the day where you had the curls and Jerry curls and people spraying? It was actually a cleaner's nightmare. Some of y'all remember what I'm talking about. Well, I was the only one in my family that the curl never took. And, and instead, I always got relaxer burns. I always had burns in my hair from all the perm and all that kind of stuff. So it just turned into an afro. Hence, you got good times up here. But anyway, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas with two brothers and two sisters. My mother was a homemaker. My dad worked for Best or, or Western Electric uh, as an electrician, and he was also a pastor and still is. Um, very close family. The one of the things that, that my father stressed on us is discipline. At the time, I thought it was really, really difficult because he was hard on me. But you'll see, as I went through and went into the Marine Corps, it was pretty easy. 
He set me up for success. Here's another dimension to me, United States Marine Corps, but prior to that, I was a All-American athlete at Texas Tech University. Ran with the likes of Michael Johnson, Leroy Burrell, both of them world record holders, Andre Kaysen, John Drummond, you name it, the who's who of some of the top sprinters in the world, I ran against them and beat them quite frequently. Um, but then again, that's just one aspect. There's that accumulation thing again. And it built, built on some other parts. Once I graduated from Texas Tech, moved on to the Marine Corps. Now, it's not like you're thinking. In the Marine Corps, to be an officer in the Marine Corps, you don't just wave your hand and say, hey, I want to join, and I'll be there. The way it works in the Marine Corps as an officer, you all go to Quantico, and there's a 46% attrition. So you might start off with about 300 candidates, and ultimately, that was the first reality show I've ever been exposed to, because we were always, somebody was always getting voted off and won't be able to become, or wasn't able to become, an officer. Again, that same accumula accumulation that makes me who I am and what I've been through. Then I moved on to corporate America. First job out of the Marine Corps. Moved to Oklahoma, took my family, moved to Oklahoma. You say, why Oklahoma? Because that's where the opportunity was. And I think that's important for a lot of you that are in college right now that you understand that never, ever deny an opportunity to yourself because it's uncomfortable. Always be open to something that's going to stretch you a little bit and allow you to grow, even with a family. So what did I do? I, was, I, I worked for Abbott Laboratories, medical cells, diagnostic equipment, hematology, clinical chemistry, immunology. You're like, well, what, what's your background? No, I was not a, a clinician by any means. I had an education degree. But again, expanded those horizons, and we're going right back to the accumulation factor where I was born, how it developed my mind. Very successful. Also, Cyberonics, as well as uh, Baxter. Now, who is this person? This is the person, I'm standing here flat-footed, is the reason that I fish today. This is my great-grandmother. Grew up in the Depression age and had a different perspective on a lot of different things. Now, one of the things is, I come from a large family, so a lot of my brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, my cousin, even my dad, did not like going fishing with his, great, with his grandmother, my great-grandmother. Why? Because she fussed too much. She talks too much. So watch this. I would be the one that went out fishing with her. Now understand, she does fuss. You just got to get past that. But also, she tells stories. Watch this. A lot of things I didn't even know about my own father. My father grew up without his dad. He never wanted to talk about it, too painful. Something he has to shield and deal with within himself. But guess what I learned about it? From hanging out with my great grandmother. So we'll be fishing and we're sitting, this is not like the fishing that I do. We're sitting on a stool and you see she has on a dress. Very strong religious woman, believed in wearing a dress everywhere. And she would sit there in a chair, and it'd be two or three in the morning. I'd go sneak in the car and try to get some sleep. And she would call me, boy, you know, you know, and tell me come out and do all this kind of thing. But I learned so much about who I was, where I came from, to have an appreciation to where I'm going from this lady right here, my great grandmother, Macy Green. Now, here's something very important. There's always critical and important points in your life that define you. One of the things I say about a person that loses a loved one, you can go one of two ways. You can go way up and use it as leverage and as motivation, or you can crash and never recover. Well, I lost my mother back in 2007. Today is her actual birthday. It was very interesting to go back, everything I've been through, and to be standing here right now on my mother's birthday. 
says a lot about that woman as well. Now, why is that important, her death in 2007? At the time I was in corporate America doing my thing, being very successful, well, guess what? There is one of the things that I had all of my life that I kept with me, and that was my ability to fish. And why was that important? Because it helped me grieve. Anyone that loses a, a parent unexpectedly, and I gladly say I was mama's boy, and my brothers and sisters will tell you the same thing. I was the brother that called, Mom, Mama, what are you doing? Ronnie, the same thing I'm doing 10 minutes ago when you called me. I was that mama's boy, always calling her, trying to check on her uh, if she needed anything. So dealing with that, the grief, and then having a hobby, my fishing. And then also my great grandmother, I used to hear a lot of great stories when I went fishing. I'm going somewhere and stay with me. Hence, that's where a fishing story was born. Born out of my pain. Imagine that. Everybody sees the show, they're like, man, that's awesome, I love it. Man, you're so excited, bow, bow, bow. All that good stuff. But behind all of that, there was a deep, dark place that I had to start from. Remember early on I talked about you are the accumulation of all your life's experiences. A lot of people think it's all about the good stuff. There's also the nasty, dark stuff. Somebody asked me, how do you describe losing your mom? And I said, man, I can't come up with words for that. But I said, I do have an analogy. I said, remember when you were a little kid and you're walking in the mall with your mom? And you know how it is. She's looking through dresses and clothes and doing her thing. And you don't want to go too far away because she tells you not to go too far away. So me and my brothers, we're rattling through clothes and doing all this other stuff. And by the time I turn around, she's gone. So here's this little young little boy walking through the mall looking for his mom. That's what it feels like. Best, best explanation I can come up with but in order for you to truly understand, I, I hope that you don't understand any time sooner than you need to, you have to experience it. That's where a fishing story came from. The story of tremendous life experiences. Good, bad, dark, ugly. You saw in the promo, I had a guest on my show. He watched his mother be murdered by his father at five years old. Imagine a child seeing that. Now watch this. That same person was taken out of the home by the state. We're gonna put you over here with your grandmother, who is the mother of the deceased. And watch this. The mother of the deceased, or his grandmother, says, I'll take it. But you're gonna have to live in this room you can't drink water, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't do all the things that we take for granted, the necessities of life, unless you ask me. So she didn't treat him like a grandson, she treated him more like the person who murdered her daughter. This is a five-year-old child. Now, this same person said, you know what? I'm not gonna let this define who I am. I'm named after my dad, Everybody knows he murdered my mother. I'm gonna change the way I see life. Remember what I said. You can go one of two ways when you have something traumatic happen in your life. You can shoot up using that motivation from the trauma, or you can crash real hard and make it very difficult to recover. He had his own family, and his boys never knew all the deep, dark secrets that he'd been through until he felt they were at an age to understand. Why is that important? Because he didn't allow any of the symptoms. He didn't do the things that his grandmother did, like lock him out of the refrigerator, send him to bed without drinking water, the basic things that we are all drinking right now. Imagine someone taking your water and you not having an opportunity or even being able to go to the bathroom. Now, this is somebody that the state turns you over to that is your grandmother. So, those are tremendous life experiences that we bring out on our show. 
Now, how did I come up with this show and how did we develop it? Because that's a lot of information to try to capture and put in a 30-minute show. Anybody know how long a 30-minute show realistically is on, on TV? Take a guess. Any? Love it. 22 minutes. Bam. Straight out of Orlando. 22 minutes. And you never thought somebody from Orlando that gets stuck in all that traffic could come up with that answer. Good answer. But 22 minutes. Why? Because there's commercials, there's advertising, and then there's also the network has to do their advertising as well besides the actual producer. So, 22 minutes, and we got to take all this life and all this emotion and everything about a person and boom, put it into a 22-minute show. So let's get into why in the world would you go, Ronnie, from medical sales, being very successful, manager of the year, uh, being promoted up the ranks, and you built your career in such a fashion. Well, one of the things I promised my mother on her deathbed, uh, uh, as I was just boo-hoo crying, uh, um, is that she kept telling me, son, I, I'm glad you're making great money, that's all good, but you're killing yourself. This is the same person every week, I was traveling like six, seven days a week. I had 13 reps and then I had half the United States. So I was constantly traveling. So I promised her that I will not kill myself working. It's okay to work hard, but what's it all worth when it's all said and done? Do what you love when you have an opportunity and you'll never work a day in your life. I know you believe that. So, here's some of the, the weaknesses. I don't know anything about the industry. I don't know nothing about editing. How many of you know anything about editing and know how to do Premiere and all this other stuff? Tell me a little bit about it. What do you know about editing? Uh, final Cut. cut. Uh-oh, you said the dark word. Final Cut. Oh, man. Final Cut. What's up with Final Cut? It's uh, Final Cut 10 now, but it acts like 7. Dude, it's... Final Cut is a nightmare. <laughs> it is a nightmare. Yeah. He's got a great point. Listen to what he's saying. <laughs> because Final Cut is an Apple product that was the industry standard. How did I learn that? No, that's not what my degree is in. It's called the School of Hard Knocks. And what I learned, dealing with contractors, you better learn how to use Premiere pretty quick, Ronnie. Dude, don't, don't believe it. <laughs> but I love Premiere, and I'm a person that's loyal to something that I learned, and it helped me to get where I needed to go. So I'm a creature of habit, so I go to Premiere. Now tell me, in, in your own short synopsis, what is editing to you? What would you do if I gave you a product what do you do in editing? Like just a bunch of raw footage and then yeah. show out of it? Yeah. Hey, make it happen. Uh, I drew a pot of coffee, sit down, review <laughs> the raw footage, and uh, organize it in the, the way that makes the best sense to me. Now, watch this. Here comes another question. What if I gave you three different cameras, and I said, it's eight hours worth of footage, and I said, do the same thing? What would you be concerned about? with three different cameras, because I need some alternative angles and everything else. First concern would be time if you're doing a limit thing. Yeah. Second would be making sure that everything lined up. Boom, he hit it. <laughs> Bam, I love it. Ha! That's what I'm talking, what's your name again? Mike. Mike. Mike the man, that's his new name, baby. Mike, Mike the man, huh? Mike the boss on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> A nice little uh, tag there. Oh, man, shameless plug. But here's the thing. Mike said something that we struggled with. We talk about the school of hard knocks. We talk about my weaknesses. I filmed this show, eight hours, three different cameras. None of it was synced. And I was like, why is my editor calling me cursing? What is this? And now I understand that I start playing with it. You have to have them sync. So those are all the things that were my weaknesses. What are some of my strengths? Some of my strengths are intangibles. How do you teach somebody drive? Never to give up. How do you teach somebody to have a personality? You can't teach it. Those are intangibles. So I had the corporate experience. I knew how to manage people. I think I got decent communication skills and military discipline. 
Military discipline is not jumping jacks and running around the block and all that kind of stuff. It's staying very committed to a vision and actually making sure that nobody drives you away from it. So, legal. What do you mean, legal? There's legal involved? I don't want no part of this, Ronnie. Yes, trademarks, logo. That logo you see, we had a trademark. Contracts. I hire you to do a job right here. What's your name? Gabby. Gabby. I said, Gabby, I need you to be uh, a camera person for today. And we're going to hire you. We're going to give you X amount of money. But I'm going to need you to sign this agreement. And I'm going to need you to have it back to me by such and such. So get it to your legal people. That's very important. Because sometimes things get lost in translation when you're actually dealing with a lot of different contractors. I think you understand that very clearly. Then they're done that. That's probably what he would say. Hey, he knows. So that's very important. Insurance, got to have that as well. So, production process. We have typically four cameras on a boat. One of my cameramen that has been with us this year is right back there. West Crowd did a show, what was the show, Bill Miller? Yeah. Bill Miller for what, 18, 19 years. This guy can do this with his eyes closed. And here it is, some rookie walking around like he knows something, and he knows way more than I do. So you gotta temper that with your knowledge and depend on people, not based on what they tell you, but based on what they show you. So we have four cameras, we'll go out. We have two boats, and why do you need two boats? One is an alternate camera angle, and the producer is on that boat. And we got, Wes is always following me around. He probably gets tired of me. He's the guy that's camera in my face, and he's constantly right here doing his thing. And then we have the drone. You saw some of the drone footage. Beautiful, looks like a plane flying over the ocean. Gorgeous stuff. That's called production value. And of course, the famous syncing all cameras. It eliminates a lot of time and it keeps you from having a headache. So we have all these people, the producer, the camera A guy, camera B guy, the drone and B-roll guy. Which guy are you, Wes? Camera A. Good answer! <laughs> Wes is camera A guy. So he actually makes sure that everything is right on the primary boat. And he's also tied in with the guests real close really close. His famous line to me, Ronnie, try it again. And I'm like, blah, 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 cut. I don't like it. Try it again. Blah, 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 blah. Imagine, everybody's watching you, and he's like, nope, don't like it. Try it again, that sounds horrible. Put some bass in your voice. I'll say this and say that. That's what West's job is. Nothing personal. That's business. And you gotta operate that way. Any questions thus far? That's a great point. I wish I could. And there are producers out there who do that. You gotta leave, one of the things I tell anyone that works with us, we leave all of our egos at the door or at the boat ramp. Why? Because we're all trying to have a unified effort to create a good show. And if there's any me's involved, Ultimately, we've compromised the integrity of the show because we're centered around a narcissistic person who wants it about them, and I can't make it about me. So we all need each other. We just gotta find a way to work, which is a great question. Can you go back one slide? I've had one more question. There. Sure. Particularly... So what eliminates unproductive editing time? I think that might be important to... Uh, yes, unproductive editing time. Matter of fact, because he was listening so well, I'm going to let you answer that, because you know it well. We just talked about sinking. Why is sinking in the... You put me on the spot. Because I, I know you're awake, and I know you, you got it figured out. Six years of experience. You volunteered six well, years. <laughs> well, go ahead. Your perspective. There's no wrong answer.
Right. In the he has a good point, because watch this. If I'm filming, you see Wes has a camera right here. And then there's another camera right there. Now when the editing process happens, this camera will get one angle. And let's say, for instance, you know, my glasses were like this. So we don't want to get that angle. We got to do a different cutaway angle. So instead of using camera A, we got to use camera B. Now, the tricky part is if they're not synced. What is synced? It's like a running table of numbers. It's constantly going, and you got to zero them out at the same time. If they're not zeroed out at the same time, this one, you might find a clip, and it says 13 minutes and 40 seconds into the show. And then this one might say 17 minutes and 15 seconds. So all of a sudden, you're looking for the same footage right here in this camera. You can't find it. Why? Because they're not synced. So that's what we're talking about, eliminate a lot of valuable time. Definitely important. Now, how many? Oh, go ahead. I just find it amazing. So for a show, you might shoot eight hours worth of video on four different video cameras. Yes. So, I mean, it, that, that's what it really comes down to the editing. I mean, how much film it, it, that you have to go through just to come into the 22 minute uh, segment, correct? Yes. John has a great point because it brings up something else. I was the actual, I'll answer your question in just a second, but I was the actual person that had to do what is called the offline. You want to take a shot at that? <laughs> Mr. Six Years. See, I'm going to teach you something. In the military, they tell us, never raise your hand and volunteer for anything. You know why? Because you're going to be an example for everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to pick on somebody else. Oh, but no, no, no. No, no. oh go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead. What, what does offline mean to you as the way you see it? We're all learning here. And remember, I am not to do the expert. Uh, that's him back there. Did I make a nice little deflection it, Wes? <laughs> but at the end of the day, what offline means is I take the footage, I look at all four camera angles on Premiere, and then I actually make sure that they're synced. And then I pick out clips. I like. I don't like this at all. Don't like this angle. Love this shot of the, this bird flying over or these dolphins. Love this shot of so-and-so. So what I do is I'll write that actual number. There's that sync number again. It says time code 1326. So I'll write that down, dolphins. So I write down all the clips of everything that's transpired. I've already did like a preliminary of the story. I love when Zach talked about his cancer experience in stage four, and then he talked about, I wouldn't change anything. We can't miss this. So I'll put that in the time code. And hence, you have a Word document, as simple as that, and we call it an offline. The first time I heard that term, you'd be surprised what I kept thinking. I was like, man, I don't get it. I don't understand. So I hope I answered your question, John. Just one last thing. So you, sure. You have four different monitors, and, that, and that's how it's all synced, and that's how you're choosing? I mean, Good question. These guys have just one kind of single monitor in front of them. That's a great question. How many of you have Apple? Nobody has Apple? We have an Apple. Okay. Well, if you have Apple, I, at least I'm an Apple person. I started off being an IBM person. What I do with my Apple, I have two monitors, and in the software, it helps you. You can divide the video cameras. So I got a full, but I got to have a big monitor. So I got two video monitors here and two here. And then I just kind of go back and forth. And if it's horrible and I haven't synced it or for whatever reason it didn't take when we synced it, there is something called Pluralize Lifesaver. It is software that will sync everything for you. And everything synced together automatically by some type of algorithm. I'm not even going to try to explain it because it's way out of my league. But that's a great question. Do you need four monitors? Absolutely not. Do you need two monitors? No, you don't. I just need it because you see right here, I have to have assistance. So I need it as big as I can get it. So two monitors work for me. Some people use one monitor. Sir, you had a good question. I know it was burning. Good question. Like I was mentioning before, the cameras have like this switch. You've seen the switch. How many of you guys remember the cassette tapes? 
You remember the cassette tapes? What was that little button? You see these numbers? It was three little numbers. And you press a button and it would reset it back to zero, right? Do you remember that? Okay, he was probably a baby. I'm going to tell you. What it does, it syncs it back to zero. So it creates this time code and it's a constantly going, moving forward. And so I get all the cameras as soon as we arrive to a destination, sit them together, the producer does, and he'll hit the button together. So they're joined as far as the numbers. So the numbers are in sync. Hence you have syncing the cameras together. Did I answer your question? Good question, my friend. I love it. One camera might have four hours on it, one might have two. Yes. But they still are linked to that time code. There. Yes. Great, great, great. Because here is another thing. John is on it. I think, John, you, you, you've been doing some production at one time. He knows his stuff. Here's the other part. We have a drone. Does a drone run all the time? No. So to his point, we might be running the drone for like an hour and a half out of an eight-hour shoot. So we can't expect to just grab the dr drone footage and put it all in together. It has to have a time code as well. So great observation. Love good questions. Love them. So I'm going to speed us up a little bit. Where does this all take us? OK, this gets a little cr crazy. Well, I'm going to talk you through it. I have a writer as well. And what the writer does, the writer takes my offline, then he writes the story. He has a degree in literature, and here it is. I thought all this time, I'm taking four and five different classes in college. I'll never use this, ever. I'll never use this, writing. Guess what? This is what this guy does for a living. He writes. And let me tell you, it can change or make or break an actual story on our show. So he writes, and he'll have a place for me to talk. And so I'll do some pre-talking about the show. I'll say, hey, right today my guest is so-and-so, and such-and-such. -and, -such. and that's called voiceover. How many of you ever heard of voiceover? What do you know about voiceover, and how would you explain it? Yes, Mr. Voiceover. Yep, great answer. That's what I'm talking about. Great answer. You're talking over video, but you don't see the person talking. You just see the actual video. So the writer writes all of the video so that we can talk, and I'll talk into my own microphone, send him the audio file. Then he sends it to the audio person, because guess what? We're outside. So what is the one thing that most people will probably be concerned about when you're outside? Since you raised your hand, I mean, I thought you, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's like, I didn't raise my hand. No, no, no. Take a guess. Wind. Bam. You guys are sharp. Bam. Wind. You know why? Because it's howling all the time, and that's one thing you can't control. You'll see the little foam on the microphones. That's to help shield some of the wind. But a lot of times, even with doing that, you still can't avoid a lot of winds because a lot of the lakes in Florida are round. So they don't have coves where you can go into and get out of the wind. So you're going to get a lot of wind. And that's where the audio guide comes in, levels it out. And you never know the difference. Then he sends it back to the editor, who sends me a snapshot of what he's put together on the timeline. Then he puts it on Vimeo. So if you've already been working with Vimeo, that's, that's a pretty good deal. You guys are way ahead of where most people uh, were when I was growing up. So you have all the tools available. And you're smiling. Tell me why you're smiling. You probably already work with Vimeo, don't you? Do you? Yeah. Do a lot on it? Yeah. Um, it helps get some professional work. Okay. Now I'm going to impose on you a little bit more. What's the difference between Vimeo and YouTube? And why would you use Vimeo over YouTube if you're a producer? Um, Boom. Bam. <laughs> good answer. That is a really good answer. Good quality. YouTube has a lot of SD video. So producers don't put stuff on YouTube unless they're actually having episodes. 
But if you actually have an interaction, because you can have virtual interaction with people by sending them a link. The link is typically never a YouTube link. It is always Vimeo. High definition, um, a lot more than like the 720p. I think they even have 1080p, so they have really high quality. That's good to know. Now, here's the final product when we first aired on the World Fishing Network. Take a look. In fishing, there's the hunt for big bass. That's a giant. <laughs> there's the camaraderie, then there's the story. I've met some great people, and I found that fishing is just as important to them as it is to me. I've learned that everyone has a good fishing story, and now I want to hear them all. A Fishing Story, a new episode airs this Saturday morning on World Fishing Network. What did you notice about this particular, just anything you noticed? Tell me what you noticed about this little promo that the network did. Voiceover. I was talking on the voiceover. So what I did, I sent them just an audio link of me talking, and then I sent them the footage, and voila, the editor did the magic. Editors are extremely powerful. So the next time you watch a movie, next time you watch a TV show, always remember there's an editor making some people look really, really good when you see the good production quality. Am I right? All right. We talked a little bit about how do I make money? Well, people just walk up to me and say, hey, man, you need some cash? No, that's not the way it works. Actually, there's something called syndication where you sell the media to multiple networks and they pay a fee or they pay however you negotiate the contracts. That's one way. Advertising sponsors. My agreement with Pasco County. They have a 30 second commercial. They're gonna have three of them. Now, the 30 second commercials are all gonna run on a show, each show. Now understand, each show has three segments. So three pieces of pie similar to that graph there. And a commercial runs in between. You know how you see five minutes of a show and then automatically it goes to commercial. Well, that commercial you see that's run during that episode, they're paying for that time. So the next time you see the Super Bowl, you're like, man, they got like 30 commercials. They're paying big. Yeah. So now you understand how that all works. Why do they have so many commercials? Because they're paying a lot of money. So hence, and then, Products, apparel, hats, fishing rods, all those things that relate to the show that people want to see. That's how we make money. Gift speaking, it's the thousands of dollars I'm paying you for today. Wow, and that's the other thing. <laughs> Y'all didn't know I was getting paid to come here and speak to keep you guys awake because they said, hey man, this is a tough crowd. They sleep all the time when we have a speaker. <laughs> so if you can keep awake, man, it's, you're going to get paid a big bonus. No, you guys have been great, and I love your attention to detail and how you understand everything. So, now, let's talk about Pasco County. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. I'm gonna be, for 2013, the show will be called Pasco pa County Presents, or Visit Pasco Presents a Fishing Story. How many of you have seen a show where it says, so-and-so, so-and-so, brought to you by or so and so and such and such presents, they have the name rights to the show. Everybody with me? That's what Pasco County is doing with me. I'm gonna be on Destination America. That's owned by Discovery Channel. We were just finished our last, our last episode for this quarter is this Saturday. Um, Sportsman's Channel as well and in the World Fishing Network. Now, Sportsman's Channel and World Fishing Network are specific networks that if you turn to that channel, you either like hunting and fishing or you don't. People that watch that channel are specific. So that's why we went to three different networks because we are addressing several demographics. Let me show you how TV works. Destination America will say, Ronnie, here is the profile of our audience. It is a, a male between the age of 28 
to 63. Uh, he drives a so-and-so uh, average salary in his home. And they keep saying his, watch me, $71,000, so-and-so, and such and such. Now watch this. Now, let's go back to I'm the sum total of all my life's experiences. Remember that MBA that I have, I showed you in an earlier slide, that I thought I didn't need. Guess what? It came in handy. Let me explain why. Before I did my show, I put together what is called focus groups. How many of you know what focus groups are? Watch what you volunteer. Watch out for volunteering. No, I'm kidding. Tell me, what do you think? Great answer. Bam, nice. Appreciate that. And why is that important before you launch a show? Because if anybody's done any selling, you're selling. And if you haven't assessed the needs of your demographic, you're wasting your time. So what I did is I created a focus group that had non-fishermen, five non-fishermen women, five non-fishing men, uh, uh, and five uh, fishing women, five fishing men, and so on and so forth. The feedback was incredible and consistent about one thing. Now, I had a perception of what I thought it would be, but it was all about the story. How about that? Everybody I talked to in the industry said, well, Ronnie, you gotta learn about this bait, you gotta learn about this bait, you gotta learn about this, and you gotta do the show like this, and you gotta talk like it's an infomercial. That's not what I wanted to do. Why? Because there's like hundreds of fishing shows out there. Do I just want to be another fishing show? Or do I want to do something different? Remember we talked about earlier, I did something different by moving to Oklahoma, outside of my comfort zone, trying something new, and was successful. So here it is again, showing up in life, 10, 15, 20 years later, you gotta do something different. So, we came out with the show, and it will run uh, commercials, the three commercials we have on Pasco County that we're doing, it's going to run a total of 273 times. Very important. 273 times. That's a lot of exposure. Why is that important? Because Destination America has an audience of 64 million households reach, potential. That's a lot of people. Then you go to the Sportsman's Channel. 36 million households. Then you go to the World Fishing Network, 20 million households. So we're looking at about 120 million households of people that are all going to learn about what? Not just a fishing story, but Pasco County presents, and then we're going to have the commercials, and then we're going to tell them about the destination. Then next thing you know, when they start doing their planning, they're going to want to at least, I've been to Florida, I've been to so many other places, but I've never been to Pasco County, and I saw it on Ronnie Green's show. How about that trash? Isn't that awesome? So, visit Pasco is the take-home message. Question on the broadcast, please. Yes. Are those 13, 13, 13 all in the same time? No. Or are you going to be spreading it out throughout the course of the year? That's a great question and great observation. What happens is the first quarter, is the World Fishing Network, first quarter. Why is that important? Because we're gonna be running three times a week each show for 13 weeks, 39 times. And that will be at like nine o'clock in the morning. That's first quarter. Then we move to second quarter, the Sportsman's Channel. So remember, we're going across all these demographics based on the networks. The Sportsman's Channel has an even a little different then the World Fishing Network will be there in the second quarter, same time slot, window, same thing. Three times a week, 39 shows. Then, third quarter, Destination America, the largest demographic, once a week, but would double, if not triple, the reach of some of the other networks. Now, have you seen how we have branched out and achieved the reach that we want to? Because the World Fishing Network is exactly that across the world in a lot of different places. Destination America is owned by Discovery Channel, just like TLC. 
A lot of you didn't know Oprah Winfrey Network is owned 50 percent by, Des by uh, Discovery Channel as well. History Channel, American Hero Channel, all owned by Discovery. So each show is divided into three segments. Now, commercial bump. I'm going to give you a sample of what a commercial bump looks like. Someone's able to sit here and talk about Steve Dial. He was a mover and a shaker, you know. He liked to get things done. He liked to, to move. He, he, uh, he burnt the day down working and inspiring. And, you know, hopefully with the fishing and the businesses, and he left something there for them. And, mm -hmm. and, he, and he was nice to people. And he didn't judge too quick. And he was uh, patient. <laughs> Uh, I, that would be good enough for me. And I'd like to leave that impression with my, my children. I would want them to, to go on and thrive and prosper and, and work hard in life and, and enjoy it too. It's okay to, it's okay to play. And Absolutely. It's, it's okay to work, real, you know, work hard, play hard. It's mm -hmm. okay. That's why we fish. You know, we fish to get our minds off things and to focus mm -hmm. on something else. And, mm -hmm. and that's okay. A fishing story is brought to you by Nitro Multi-Species Performance Boats and by Bob's Machine Shop, high performance and made in the USA. Anybody recognize that famous voiceover artist? Me. That's called how to, how, how to do it the way I was raised. My dad didn't believe in buying a lot of different things. If you can do it yourself, do it yourself. Now there's always experts. God forbid if I try to do everything like my dad, sometimes you just got to take the car to get it maintenance by a real person and not try to do it yourself, okay? Sometimes you just got to do the, you know, let the professionals do it. So I felt like I had a little bit of a communication skill set to do that, and so we end up doing that. Now, I'm going to move on to one last thing. Well, this is two last things. This is a sample commercial that we did about a week ago. And I want you to try to guess where this is in Florida. My company, we did the, it's dolphins, drone. Just last Monday. Mermaids from Wikiwachi. How about that? Mermaids. Scallop diving. Trying to get me to eat a scallop because I don't eat raw, but I had to do it at least for the camera. <laughs> Now this is just a little teaser, but we talked about how do you make money. That's the other thing we do. Green Outdoors, we do commercials as well. We have the capability. I wrote the commercial. I said, remember that English class that you didn't like going to? I had to write my own commercial. This is my place to fish, my place to hike, my place to scallop my place to sing. You see the tag. So what it does, it intrigues a person, especially a person like me who doesn't eat raw stuff, unless it's sushi. But I actually can get intrigued by seeing the scallops because it looks delicious. And we haven't done the official commercial, but this is just a little teaser for today's presentation. Now, last but not least, Ronnie, how can we be a part of a fishing story. Who knows, you may even have a story that I'd like to hear. These are all being submitted. How can I do some edits for you and get paid for it? Or how can I tie it into my university and have it as an internship? Obviously, everything we do, we want to do through Jennifer or through John, because you want to be able to get some credit for it in some capacity, because you're also learning. Now, one of the things I used to get all the time when I was a sales manager in medical sales 
hey, uh, what do I need to do to get into medical sales? I said, well, you got any medical sales experience? No. Well, then how do I get it, man? If I can't get any sales experience, somebody got to give me the opportunity. Well, I'm just not the place to get it. Here it is. You have an opportunity in the field you're potentially going into to get some experience. So by the time you're done with college, you're saying, hey, guess what? I was on a national TV show. Hello, ABC. Hello, NBC. You ever think about that? Remember, sum total of all your life's experiences. Your great-grandmother, Ronnie, taking you fishing. Your mother dying, helping you to decide that you need to find something else that's going to make you happy and not just work. All those things. Here's the other thing. If you watched what I had on, on the screen, one of the things that we said in the story when we gave the description of a fishing story, everyday people like I said entertainers. I said veterans. I said, but at the end of the day, you got to go where the people tell you to go. My ratings didn't say it because I have, my brother played in the NFL for several years. I was a world-class athlete. So we have all this athletes, friends. But my audience say we love everyday people. Not with what they're saying with their mouth, but with the ratings. My highest ratings were with everyday people. So I can be in an elevator and my wife's like, oh no, he must be a Marine because you know how Marines are. We'll start talking and it's over with. The next thing you know, I'm talking and I'm exchanging a card and this person's telling me about their life. I had that skill set when I was younger. I was like, why did this person just tell me all their business? I don't even know you. Well, at the end of the day, I see that it had a place. So now I was able to take that, said, I'd love to talk to you more. I sent him that sizzle reel, said, we'd like to have you on the show. So that's how we get our guests, everyday people. That's why I said, one of you may be a guest and don't even know it. Let's that's give it up for Ronnie. I think I'd like to